In just a moment, we're going to have this sort of shared experiment, shared experience together that, that I've called Vision Sunday. Um, but I want to say even, even before that, um, that some of you, well, first of all, the word, the word liturgy in, in Greek means the work of the people. And, and this morning, I'm going to put you all to work. So get ready. Um, also, if you're kind of new to the congregation, if you're brand new and, and you think, what am I supposed to do? First of all, you are completely welcome to, to participate um, to the extent that, that you feel like you want to do that. Um, and, and also, if you're, if you're new, you may kind of listen and, and you'll hear some stuff about how the church runs and operates that will, that will inform you. Um, and that also, I'm, I'm reminded that, that Kurt Vonnegut said, people don't come to church for fancy preachments. They come to daydream about God. And so, um, and so have, if, if, you want, if you want to just use the, the silence to daydream about God, that's, that's great as well. So just about two years ago, I was hurtling through the skies at tremendous speed. And if you were here last week and I talked about my misadventures paragliding in South Africa or South America, don't worry. Um, this time wasn't about extreme thrill seeking. Two years ago, I was hurtling through the skies at tremendous speed inside a plane en route to RDU, where I was about to interview for the position of minister here at the community church. And I was using the time on the plane to kind of read up about the congregation and, and find out about you. So I read first Charlie Cast's um, really excellent sermon-length retelling of this congregation's history. What an outstanding document. And then I was reading through pages and pages of results from surveys and cottage meetings where people talked about their hopes and their dreams and their desires and their wishes and their preferences. And then I pulled up another document, 14 pages long, entitled the Community Church of Chapel Hill Unitarian Universalist Strategic Plan, 2013 to 2015. I read through it once, and upon finishing page 14, I thought to myself, I didn't get all of that. So I read it, I went back to the beginning, and I read it a second time, and then we're, we're, by that point, we were beginning our descent into RDU, and I thought, before my interview with the search committee, I'm going to have to read this thing one more time to get it. And here's what I remember thinking. My first thought was, wow, these people are intense. <laughs> you guys are a bunch of busy beavers. Uh, the people who came up with this, they had not only had their morning coffee, they had had extra espresso shots and a handful of chocolate-covered espresso beans and a, and a monster energy drink as well when they came up with this. And then, with a smile, I came across a paragraph in the, in the two-page preamble to the strategic plan, and this paragraph made me smile. It said, uh, this, this paragraph said, the plan accommodates our search for a new settled minister. The plan acknowledges the talents, interests, and vision of our new minister play an important role in our work together, so we've intentionally left space in the plan <laughs> for the new minister to add to it. Um, <laughs> And I, and I had to smile at that. Here's a 14-page plan. But if you want to add more, you should feel, we want to encourage you to do that. As an outsider, as an outsider reading that plan, there are some lessons and meanings that I took away from it. <clears throat> first, the first lesson, it was clear that, that you are a people, we are a people with a whole lot of ambition. But even more than that, it was clear that we are, we were and we are, a people who felt fully liberated to dream. And let me see if I can explain what I mean by that. So imagine, I want you to imagine a congregation that doesn't have a very functional sanctuary. Maybe the sanctuary is, is unattractive and ugly, or it's too small and cramped, or the piano is a piece of junk. And so you ask a congregation, if you were to ask a congregation like that to articulate its worship vision, they would tell you that vision in three or four words. It would be renovate the sanctuary, expand the sanctuary, or get a better piano. You know, they'd be able to say that vision in three or four words. 
Um, and actually, if you go back, the strategic plan that was in place way before that, actually it was. If you looked at our worship vision, it was like, build a new sanctuary, period. And there wasn't, there wasn't that much to it. It was like everybody knew what the need was. But for us, for us, the, the, the dreams were, were broad and wide. It, we talked about the worship vision, talked about creating new worship spaces beyond this room and expanding the current experience and expanding worship into the larger community by going out into the community and doing it. It was, it was a broad vision. Or suppose you ask a congregation about its religious education vision. Here's how many churches will say, what do you want, to, what do you want most for religious education? And, and some will say, here's our vision. We're going to recruit enough teachers to be able to hold religious education. <laughs> or some would say their vision is, get enough youth to come that we can have a youth group. That would, and that would be it. It's like, all right, the need is there, and we're all very clear on it. But ours, if you go to our religious education vision, we are liberated to dream. Ours had to do with expanding current offerings and providing the children and youth who are here with an experience that connects, I'm quoting, with an experience that connects them with their faith and with an entire multi-generational community in a transformative way. And so what I'm saying is that the content of these dreams and the content of visions and strategies that we came up with were, were liberated, were liberated, and all of them across the board had much more to do with building on existing strengths than on remedying current deficiencies. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? It wasn't about, like, fixing something we all agreed was broken. It was about, like, dreaming vastly. And so... I want to take a moment, as we continue on, I want to take a moment to be honest with you. The title of this service, Vision Sunday, is actually a tiny bit of a bait and switch. Um, I have to tell you, Strategic Planning Sunday doesn't quite have the same ring to it, and if I announced Strategic Planning Sunday, I think about half of you would have stayed home, and, and that half is probably wanting to leave right now. Um, so, so here's what's going on. The current, the current strategic plan we've been operating under comes to an end of its three-year cycle later this spring. And all fall, I met regularly with the strategic management team of this church. Uh, the strategic management team is a, is a committee of the board. It includes a few board members, a few members of the congregation at large, and, and myself. And its charge is to do three things, to kind of promote the existing strategic plan, keeping it in front of us so that we're working towards it together. The second goal is to monitor and evaluate the progress we're making on it. And then third is when it's time to create a new strategic plan, it's to kind of lead and initiate that process. So I spent the fall meeting with the members of the strategic management team, and we were going back and forth about different ideas about how we might kind of engage that process into the spring. And I asked, so how, what did you do last time? And, and here's what I was told, is, is that we had a kind of a two-day weekend workshop, all day Saturday, and then, and then Sunday afternoon and evening, 15 hours in all, of kind of intense, intense work together. And, and the stream manager team said, we don't want to do that again. <laughs> so they said, come up, with, come up with something that is not, come up with something that's not 15 hours on a Saturday and Sunday. And I, and I sort of threw out the idea, well, what if, what if we were to kind of take a worship service and, and make, a work, make that the focus of a worship service? And, and they all thought that was a great idea, and, and it was like a win-win. We, we don't have to spend 15 hours at church on a Saturday and Sunday, and I don't have to write a sermon, which is like win-win-win. <laughs> so here's what the process is going to be. I'm going to give you some, some instructions, and then I'm going to lead a little reflection. And during the reflection, I want you to just meditate. And then after it, I'll give you a cue, and you're going to have about two or three minutes of silence to write. And then Eric and, uh, and, and our bass player, they will start playing, and that will be the cue that there's about two or three minutes more to write. So you've got about, you've got about five or six minutes to think and to write, and then we're going to do it all, a, all again. Um, so short meditation, think and write for about two to three minutes. Musical interlude, two to three minutes more to write. 
And then um, at the end after this, we go through this twice, there'll be the offertory, and you will put all the cards, your cards, your note cards, in the offering basket, and then they will get magically delivered to me after the service by the ushers. The first question, if the community church of Chapel Hill didn't exist, why would we need to create it? If the community church of Chapel Hill didn't exist, why would we need to create it? Earlier this week, I met with a lay leader in the congregation, and I was giving her a sneak preview of the questions we'd be asking in the service this morning. Um, and, I, and I mentioned this question, and then I kind of casually dropped how, how I had once heard someone answer this question, this question of imagining the church didn't exist, by saying, the church didn't exist, my teenage child would not have taken the, the all, our whole lives sexual education course that we offer. And um, this person kind of, kind of shivered trying to imagine her child, now an adult, living in the world, going through high school, going through um, young adulthood without our whole lives, what that difference has made, what that that transformation happened. I once had another person answer this question this way. He said, I can't imagine what it would be like if the church did not exist. I think I would be so profoundly lonely. Many of the people I count as those most important to me, I found through church. Another person told me, if, if church didn't exist, we would need to create it so that I do not have to face what I'm going through alone. And so I invite you to imagine with me. I want you to imagine the, the bamboo out in the parking lot growing in, encroaching over the pavement. I want you to imagine the, the ivy growing up out of the canyon, growing against the sides of the building, growing up its walls and covering it. Imagine limbs falling across the pathway of the memorial rock. This spacious land returning to wild earth. Imagine as if by disappearing ink, the name Community Church of Chapel Hill fades from the lists of organizations that support the Interfaith Council for Social Service or Moral Mondays or Justice United or so many more. Imagine a Google search for Unitarian Universalist Chapel Hill returning no search results, asking, do you mean Unitarian Universalist Durham? Imagine. Now imagine you're walking down Mason Farm Road and come to the corner of Purefoy. You look into the wild bramble of weeds and vines and say, I want something to exist. I need something to exist. I want something to exist here. If the community church of Chapel Hill didn't exist, why would we need to create it? I invite you to write. How, how was that for everybody? Okay, everybody still, still here? Good, good. You're, you're welcome to Dave Room About God if you don't feel like writing, too. So, um, Have you ever heard, has anyone here ever heard of Frederick Buchner? Is that a name that's familiar to a few people? A few people. Um, he's still, still alive. He's about 90 years old. Um, Buchner is a semi well-known mainline Protestant uh, author, writer, uh, and theologian. Um, he's probably best known for his um, spiritual book, Listening to Your Life. It's a book that often gets paired with Quaker Parker Palmer's a book, Letting Your Life Speak. Um, I was actually reading a little bit about, about Buchner, and um, one sort of brief biography of him it was, it went like this. It said... Um, 
Buchner grew up in New Jersey, um, where his, his early life was marked by uh, grief and, and tragedy, um, but he became happier when he moved to Bermuda, <laughs> which, is an, which is an interest. I, I'm not sure if the author of that really connected the two, you know? Um, just had to, had to include it. It became, wouldn't we all? Um, <laughs> Buchner's most famous quotation is this. It is, the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. And I want to read the passage from one of his books um, where he talks, where this, where this line occurs. It's a, his, his, it's a reflection on vocation. And Buchner writes, and I don't, I don't agree with him, but I think that it, how he thinks is, is really interesting, so I invite you to, to follow along. Uh, he says, vocation, it comes from the Latin vocare, to call, and means the work a man or woman is called to by God. There are all different kinds of voices calling to you, to all different kinds of work, and the problem is to find out which is the voice of God rather than the voice of society, say, or the superego or self-interest. By and large, a good rule for finding out is this. The kind of work God usually calls you to is the kind of work, A, that you need most to do, and B, that the world most needs to have done. If you really get a kick out of your work, you've presumably met requirement A. But if your work is writing TV deodorant commercials, the chances are that you've missed requirement B. And like a little, <laughs> little judgment there from him. And then uh, on the other hand, he says, if your work is being a doctor in a leper colony, you've probably met requirement B. But if most of the time you're bored and depressed by it, the chances are you have not only bypassed A, but probably aren't helping your patients much either, he writes. <clears throat> and then he says this. He says, neither the hair shirt nor the soft birth will do. Neither the hair shirt or the soft birth will do. The place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. I've observed that most UU churches, ours included, tend to have a tripartite mission statement. They have a within, a within, an among, and a beyond. Ours is, listen, you can see here the within, among, and beyond. Our mission statement here in this church is to support spiritual growth. That's the within to nurture and care for each other, that's the among, and then to effect change through our love of the world, that's a beyond, beyond these walls. Um, I actually, in working with Pete Bird this past year on strategic management, Pete found an even shorter way of saying it, um, seven letters. He said, mission statement needs to have a me, a we, and an all. Me, we, all, which is, I like, I like that, seven, seven letters, me, we, all. Our second writing meditation asks you to consider these deeping, deepest longings in the me and the we and the all. And so I ask in your own heart, in our congregation and in our wider community and world, what transformation do you most wish for this congregation to further? Where is it in your deepest longing? where your great joy and the world's great need meet. As you imagine that transformation which might unfold, whether that transformation is inside of you, whether that transformation is, is within the walls of this church, whether that transformation is, is happening beyond our walls through our good work. I want to invite you to wonder what, what transformation makes you smile with joy fulfills your deepest longing, gets you excited, gets you singing and laughing and humming. This time we'll take about three minutes to write, and then when, um, when Linda calls for the offering, the, mu the music will play, and when the, when the baskets come around, I invite you to place your card as well as uh, any, 
any monetary donation in the basket as it comes around and our exercise will be, will be concluded. In your own life, in our church community, in the wider community, what transformation do you most long for?